Welcome back to another edition of the Saturday to Sunday Football Podcast. It is episode 500 here at Saturday to Sunday. We are live on YouTube at the S to S channel over there. Hopefully you are joining us either over there or listening to this on any, you know, any way you listen to the podcast usually. And I'm really excited. We're doing a Dynasty Rookie Mock Draft tonight. But before that, the return here at Saturday to Sunday, Mr. Macaraccio, welcome back. It is nice to see you across the board for me this evening, my friend. Paul, I don't, I don't even really know what to do with myself right now. This is like all foreign to me. I mean, like, I mean, here we are. We're 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 breaching into like the you know the 21st century, like video and audio. It's like you know, it's a it's a brave new world, my man. I, I got to tell you, this is I'm so psyched. I'm so excited for the people that we have here tonight and this evening to to share this opportunity with us. And it really, it really just. It gives me goosebumps, man, when I really think about the journey to episode 500, the ups, the downs, the roller coaster ride, the uncertainty, uh, the grind, as you would say, that everybody I'm sure in this industry has gone through many times over. Um, it's just a privilege to be here. So I'm excited, dude. I can't wait to start. Yeah. And in addition to Matt rejoining the pod tonight, we are really excited to be joined by two special guests to help us do this rookie mock draft tonight and celebrate 500 episodes here at Saturday to Sunday. First, let me bring in John Lobb. John, you have been a regular uh, visitor here at Saturday to Sunday over our time here through these 500 episodes. You pretty much make a yearly once or twice visit here. We appreciate all the times. It is glad to have you back on the show for tonight's big episode 500. Well, thank you for having me for 500. And it made me reminisce because I remember I found you guys. It must be like eight or nine years ago now. You know, when you're flipping through, you search podcasts on like iTunes or something. You guys came up Saturday to Sunday. I started listening. So I've been at least listening for eight or nine years. And I've been I probably seven years that I on so thank you very much but congratulations 500 that's you know if you're doing 50 a year that's once a week that's impressive gentlemen i mean it's amazing thank you thank you john we appreciate the kind words and all the support you've always given us over the years and let me bring in our other special guest felix sharp camping uh canton the uh campus to canton felix i know i was really excited to be able to join you the other day for the devi summit really excited to finally have you here at saturday to sunday Thank you for joining us. We're really excited to have you tonight. I'm a, I'm a regular listener of this podcast. Matt, you and I have had conversations behind the scenes, so it's good to talk to you with microphones on. Uh, we first interacted in Brandon's Debbie dashboard, but uh, like I said, I'm a regular listener to this podcast, so to be involved with your 500th episode is is really an honor, and uh, I sincerely, sincerely appreciate you having me here. Absolutely. So, Wait, guys, Paul, but Paul, before yeah. we go crazy, I, I have to interrupt and just just give you an applause on the side as we approach episode 500. So just give you the shout out for for keeping the train rolling. You know, everybody's going to have those those years, those weeks, those months where, you know, things we all know that things beyond football and, you know, are really important. And the ability to be able to do this is a privilege, but the ability to be able to do it with a friend and and to have somebody always have your back like you've had for me throughout the years um, is something that, you know, I don't want to get teary eyed because now everybody can see me, but I want to, I want to at least say, I, I am so appreciative of that relationship and everything that we've had this year and your ability to just keep the train moving this year. You've done everything anything short of amazing would be an would be an understatement. So I am just applauding you and sending out just an amazing just sentiment that I hope you accept, which is thank you for being you. Thank you for doing what you did this past year, keeping our podcast, our dream and our passion alive. So I, I just had to do that. Sorry well, guys. I didn't it's it's been my pleasure. We do this as something 
it's a hobby on the side because of the passion that we have for it. And I mean, when we started this journey at episode one, way back when, when it was me, you and Nick Whalen, I'm not sure we ever really could have imagined that we would be here at episode 500 years later. I mean, probably six years now we're going on, whatever, whatever the time frame might be, you know, we've done so many now. We don't even remember the year that we started, but it, it's something that is always something that I look forward to. You know, people have their interests, their likes, their hobbies. Saturday, Sunday is something that, you know, it's close to my heart. I'm glad we've been able to keep it going. You know, at times people are more available than others. And, and it's been it's been a great ride. And hopefully here's to another 500 after this as well. Uh, we'll do some more thank yous a little bit towards the end of the show as well. But let's kind of jump right into this and get this rookie Mock draft started. We're going to go PPR. We're going to go super flex to inflate that value of the quarterbacks a little bit, especially in a little bit of a weaker quarterback class this year. Uh, so let's kind of get right into it. Felix, you, we, pre, we predetermined the orders before tonight's episode. So why don't you get it going here with the first pick in the first round? Who would be your pick? A little short sentence or two or a description or two of, of why it would be the, the pick for you uh, in this rookie mock draft. Yeah, I think that there's consensus around Brees Hall being the one-on-one, so I'm not going to belabor that point. Uh, however, I will note that um, uh, one question for me had been fit, whether or not Brees Hall is a fit for this wide zone scheme that the Jets are borrowing from the 49ers. Uh, are they going, is Brees Hall going to be a fit? Well, we talked to, you mentioned the Debbie Summit. I asked Matt Waldman that specific question. Can Brees Hall run that scheme? And I mean, it wasn't a concern for him, so it's not going to be a concern for him, for me. In a class that doesn't have, you know, that elite tier, the elite tier, I mean, somebody consider Brees Hall to be that, I don't necessarily. You got to love the draft capital, the landing spot, and and quite frankly, the offense. As, as bad as Zach Wilson was last year, his potential saving grace would be running a similar scheme to what he ran at BYU. And that's exactly what they're running uh, with the Jets. So, you know, hopefully it'll be wheels up for Zach Wilson, that offense, Garrett Wilson, that I'm sure we'll uh, talk about later on. But it's got to be Brees Hall at the 101 here. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's the, the, the pick, you know, regardless. It's a, not a very deep running back draft. And Brees Hall, early round two draft capital. I know people were very high on Michael Carter, but fourth round pick, not a guy who I think is a workhorse. And, and we don't have those true bell cows, but I think Brees Hall is the closest thing we got to a three down back in this. And the wide receivers, I find it hard. And I'm interested to pick your guys' brains tonight as we kind of move through this. You know, I don't see a lot of separation at the top with clarity in terms of this guy definitively. At the running back position, I think we have that clarity with Brees Hall as a three down back. Another guy obviously be in the mix and go pretty early here, but then it, it does kind of separate a little bit. So I think Brees Hall is going to be the guy that we kind of universally see. Obviously, what you already have on your roster, if you were loaded at running back, I could see somebody pivoting to a wide receiver. Uh, you know, But here we're just doing it a little bit more generalized, but obviously in – each person's type of league, it would be a little bit different if you were loaded at the running back position, maybe transition and pivot over to one of the wide receivers. Uh, you know, we know their longevity is a little bit longer than a running back. So I can make that argument for it. But I think Brees Hall would be the guy that would have been the pick for me as well if I was picking that 101. And I think that's pretty much the consensus unless, you know, a team really dictated, you know, something a little bit differently. So, John, let me kick it over to you for 1.02. Usually, I think you would consider the quarterback here, but there's not a quarterback I like in the super flex. Um, and I'm I'm not – Brees Hall's the consensus, number one. I don't like any of the running backs here. It's too early in my book. So I'm going to go with wide receiver. The question is, it was very hard for me to say, who's my top receiver? And what I've ended up is landing spot matters, and, Paul, you had alluded to it. It's a hard group to differentiate this year, and many people had different opinions pre-draft. But I'm going to go with Drake, Drake London right here at number two. I, I'm going to do it because opportunity is there. They, I mean, you look at the wide receiver depth chart in Atlanta, it's not very pretty. They lost Russell Gage, you know, through free agency to Tampa Bay. I don't like the other names there. 
You do have Pitts, which I think benefits him, but he's ultimately a tight end, you know, slash flex type player. I think London is the most likely to get over 100 targets of the rookies. Also, if Atlanta is as bad as Las Vegas, and I think most of us look at the roster, they're not a very good team. They might be getting C.J. Stroud or Bryce Young next year to quarterback that team depending on where they fall. So I like Drake London here. I'll take him. I think him and Pitts are the cornerstone of the passing game for at least the next four years. So I'm going to go Drake London. Yeah, I mean, I think Drake London. Drake London is such an interesting player because he's a guy that I wasn't as high on pre-draft compared to, I think, what the consensus was. He was wide receiver five for me. I think most people had him at wide receiver one or wide receiver two. And then he was the first one that came off the board. And then since the draft has completed, I've kind of pushed him up my board a little bit because I don't really think any of the wide receivers went into perfect landing spots. I think you can make the case that there are some questions about all of them, right? For Drake London, it's the quarterback position. There's still maybe some overlap in terms of where he wins best. Is it going to be the same places where Kyle Pitts wins best? But there's questions about all the guys. He steps into an immediate opportunity where he could potentially see a massive target share in year one. I'm under the impression Calvin Ridley is never playing for the Atlanta Falcons again, too. Yeah, that's- so, you know, even if after the year suspension, my guess is they they move on from him via trade. So I don't think they're going to invest in another guy early in the draft next year. They invest in back-to-back years, Kyle Pitts and Drake London. I think it'll be about getting that quarterback, like you said, unless they find a diamond in the rough and Desmond Ritter could, you know, outperform draft capital and outperform expectations that I do – I am starting to move towards, I could see why Drake London would be the pick at, as the first wide receiver. I think you can make an argument for a couple other guys, though, and we'll talk about them a little bit more collectively once they come off the board here. Uh, so, Matt, let me bring this over to you for the 1.03 pick. Obviously, Brees Hall, Drake London off the board. Who are you going here with at pick 1.03? You know, this is a really – it's a really tough kind of pick here for me because – in one respect, I think there's a player on this board that has really grown on me um, over the last year or so. Um, I think he really has this quality to him that's going to allow him to be that versatile weapon um, in a pro offense. It's going to give him the ability to do the things that everybody at you know from Debo Samuel to you know AJ Brown do. Um, and There's also then another player who I'm going to go with here that I'm going to be honest with you. I've been passionate about him since he went to Ohio State, and I just can't help but go with the guy that I think is probably the one of the best, if not the best, overall wide receiver in this class, and that's going to be Garrett Wilson of the New York Jets. And I just feel I just feel so confident that. He is a player that when I think dynasty, I think of a player that I can kind of just say he's going to be good no matter who the quarterback is, no matter what system he's in. He'll have the opportunity to evolve, grow, and become a central component of that offense. And I think Garrett Wilson, along with a really kind of budding NFL offense, when you look at the Jets, I mean, they've done nothing but do it right. I mean, we don't usually associate those words with the Jets. Usually doing it right and the New York Jets do not go hand in hand. But I think everybody who is listening to this is going to say that they are arguably one of the two best drafts this year. There's no doubt about that. They're in the argument for having one of the best drafts this year. And when you look at the talent pool that they have around them, Corey Davis. Yeah, Corey Davis is a better number two. He's not a number one. He never was a number one coming out of you know, coming out of school, he was always a guy situated to be the perfect Batman Robin combination, but more Robin than somebody else's Batman. And I think Elijah Moore adds a lot of versatility to that offense. And then they go and grab Garrett Wilson, who I think is going to be able to attack at all levels of the field and really put coverages on notice this year that you can't fall asleep. And I think Zach Wilson, he's going to have no excuses when everything is said and done. This is it. This is his opportunity. Let's see what you can do. So I'm going to take Garrett Wilson and I'm going to take him for the win. And I'm going to hope and I'm going to hope that he is not only just a player that's going to do well this year, but a staple for years to come. 
Yeah, I mean, Garrett Wilson was my number one wide receiver pre-draft. I comped him excessively to Calvin Ridley. A lot of people out there in draft Twitter and the, and the major draft media also said Stefan Diggs. I see all those comparisons with a guy like Garrett Wilson. You know, it's going to be interesting, right? It's time now for Zach Wilson to, you know, make be the guy. They've given him everything, right? Two tight ends in free agency, a tight end in the draft, Elijah Moore last year, Corey Davis is a solid wide receiver, and now another wide receiver, a top 10 pick. They made upgrades on the offensive line. It's now time for him to take that next step, but he goes into an offense where there are some other receivers there. A lot of questions on Zach Wilson still you know, persist. It'll be interesting to kind of see what we make out of how quickly Garrett Wilson develops into maybe that prolific wide receiver that I do think he has the capabilities to become, but we'll see how quickly he gets there. Uh, I'm on the clock now at pick 1.04, and I am going to stick obviously with the wide receivers, and I'm going to pick Traylon Burks. He was drafted by Tennessee to replace A.J. Brown. They got the pick by trading A.J. Brown to the Eagles, and they immediately select Traylon Burks uh, with that pick to be the basically one-for-one one replacement of A.J. Brown. And I think he steps into probably, besides Drake London, the second most immediate opportunity. They did trade for Robert Woods. I feel like some people that kind of got lost in the shuffle in free agency. It was a very under-the-radar move for like a sixth-round pick. And if Robert Woods is healthy, he, he's a heck of a wide receiver. So, but the thing about Traylon Burks, and I, I kind of want to shoot this around real quick because, you know, some of the, the first couple of guys, there wasn't a lot of discussion points. But Traylon Burks is a guy that I feel like the perception of him has been really off pre draft and even post draft. And this was a guy that, for some reason, heading into the combine, people were throwing out DK Metcalf comparisons. Then people were throwing out Debo Samuel comparisons and the DK Metcalf ones. I, I don't even know where they started from. I don't know what film people were watching because nothing that Traylon Burks did at Arkansas resembled what DK Metcalf was asked to do at Ole Miss. DK Metcalf has got blazing speed, wins vertically down the field. That is not Traylon Burks' game. Debo's a different player in terms of his movement, in terms of his acceleration and bursts. I get the Debo a little bit, but since last summer, I just kept coming back to who's Traylon Burks remind me of AJ Brown, the body type, how he was asked to play at, in terms of what Arkansas asked him to do compared to what they asked AJ Brown to do. And I feel like there's some revisionist history that's gone on. And I feel like people are making out that AJ Brown was this complete player coming into the NFL. And that's just not true. Like if people dig up what people were saying about A.J. Brown when he came into the league, I had him as my number one wide receiver that year. That was not a common theme that year. He, was, he wasn't he was even considered really to go in round one. He was a mid, he was a early to mid second round pick. That's where he was on most people's mock drafts. That's where he was in most people's rankings. Most people didn't have him as their number one wide receiver. They had him in that three to five range. And there were major question marks about whether A.J. Brown could play on the outside. Now, he quickly answered them in the NFL in a resounding yes. And I feel like because he answered them so quickly that he could be this complete player, win inside, win outside, dominate after the catch with his physicality and strength, I feel like people have forgotten that there were questions about his route running. There were questions about whether or not he can play outside because he just wasn't asked to do it much at Ole Miss. And I feel like people are like, oh, A.J. Brown was this much more complete player than Traylon Burks. I'm not sure. I think a lot of the questions that were there about A.J. Brown are there about Traylon Burks. And we'll get an answer. But I also think we live in a, in, a, in a world now that if you get with the right team and the right system, he's just going to be peppered with targets, quick slants, screens, just like they used A.J. Brown early, off the play action in Tennessee. They're going to, I think they're going to maximize his skill set. And then we'll see if he becomes that more complete player in terms of running the full route tree, winning outside. I think those are to be determined. We're not sure yet, but I think people 
aren't remembering what A.J. Brown was coming out of Ole Miss. They're remembering how quickly he transitioned from the Saturday to Sunday game, and then they're comparing him to that player. And that's not how people should be doing comparisons. I always do comparisons, what they reminded me of coming out. So, Matt Felix, you're on. Yeah. I just looked it up. He was drafted behind Marquise Brown, Nikhil Harry, and Debo Samuel. A.J. Brown was the 19th pick in the second round. So yep. what was Burks, 20th pick of the round list? I think he was the 20th pick. Let me see quickly. 18. 18 so he in round one. A full round later than Traylon Burks. Yeah. And, and remember, most people had DK Metcalf ahead of A.J. Brown in their pre-draft rankings that year also. I mean, and DK, DK Metcalf fell way too far too, obviously. So the NFL didn't do a great job of evaluating wide receivers that year, right? Nikhil Harry going round one letting DK Metcalf and AJ Brown fall to round two. I just think there's a little bit of revisionist history there. Felix, before you make your pick at 1.05, any, any thoughts on eight on I almost said AJ Brown, any thoughts on Traylon Burks and you, what you think he's, do you think he's going to have a hard time transitioning or is it a little bit of if Tennessee uses him right early on, you could see him making an impact early. You know what? I just have a quick thought about that because then okay. I'll, I'll throw it to Felix um, you know, with regards to, I, I think the NFL and I think NFL coaches and I think NFL personnel and team personnel, they're getting hip to the idea, whether they want to frame it as skill, they want to frame it as understanding a player's strengths or weaknesses, however you want to frame it. I think we're getting the drift that people want it now. They want to have success now. So they're more accustomed to and interested in looking at the tape, not just as a, an evaluative tool, but also maybe as a, an, a tool for understanding how they might be able to implement them. And I think that's becoming more and more of a trend, especially at the wide receiver position, because it's becoming that position. And we, we will come into this, I'm sure, later on. It's something that we're we're constantly refueling with the college class. We're retooling with the recent college class, trying to build out our rosters, trying to build out our offense. And I think that you don't necessarily have to be a jack of all trades. You could be, and that's wonderful. But I think if you got the right coach in the right situation, which I do think Traylon Burks has, and we saw it because he's going where A.J. Brown went, I think he's going to find success just by virtue of the fact that they're going to be interested and aware and sensitive to working towards his strengths as a player. Felix, I'm gonna I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I think that Traylon Burks is going to be um a quarterback's friend with bubble screens and such out of the backfield, almost an extension of the running game. That's what he did at uh at Arkansas. And so, I mean, normally you see smaller guys running those types of routes, but can he develop into a route run that can be deployed down the field? I don't know, but I know that early on in his career, you can just say Sid Hutt and throw it to him out of the slot on these bubble screens, and he can go get five, ten yards and maybe even break one uh, for a long touchdown. Like we've seen, we saw Demarius Thomas play that way under under Peyton Manning, the jailbreak screens and the and the bubble screens. I mean, uh, uh, Traylon Burks can be that type of weapon early on in in his career. So. Um, Paul, you want me to go ahead and make my next yeah, yeah. pick now? Go, go, go right okay. in. So just got just to recap, Reese Hall, number one, went to Felix. Uh, Drake London to John at 1.02. Garrett Wilson went third to Matt at 1.03. And then I just selected Traylon Burke. So Felix, keep this going at the 1.05. Yeah, and I think that that at four is a is a tear break because um, I have questions about these players after, after that. I mean, including the player that I'm going to take, Jamison Williams, questions about his health. But it's funny, I said – uh, before the season or when the season was unfolding that Jamison Williams would be a perfect pick for the Detroit Lions because if you know anything the Detroit Lions Anthony Lynn was their offensive coordinator last year a former NFL running back himself uh, when he was uh, at the head of the Buffalo Bills offense a, a couple of years ago they led the league in rushing that's when LaShawn McCoy you know was, was the league leader in rushing and what's the perfect complement to a strong running game is is a player that can take advantage of one-on-ones down the sideline. And then who did they trade it up to get that player in Jamison Williams? I don't know that they're I think health is a question for Jamison Williams. I th I think the fact that he was fourth on the depth chart uh at Ohio State before he transferred to Alabama, but you look at the way that even the way he was deployed at Ohio State, look at the 
playoff in 2020 when they're playing Clemson. When they needed a big play, they went to Jamison Williams with all of those wide receivers on the field. So um, if he were uh, if he were not injured in the championship game, I think I would have more confidence in this pick. But in Dynasty, I'm looking for the long term. I, I think that the lines are still going to be – the offensive line is going to be the focus of that team. I think DeAndre Swift is going to be the focus of the team. Jamal Williams, they're still going to run the ball. And so he might not have the volume. But I think that he can develop that. And when they get a quarterback there that can um, take advantage of the weapons that they're uh, uh, accumulating there in Detroit, we may see a higher ceiling. But right now I'm going to take the player that I believe – I believe has elite speed, uh, 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 is very good off the line as far as uh, releases go. And let me just, yeah, Williams. And uh, I think that his stock is just going to be, is just going to, to, to increase as the seasons go on. Yeah. I mean, the turf there, I think it's going to be something where I'm not sure early on Jared Goff's going to be able to maximize Jamison Williams true skill set. but you know what we saw last year that, Tua couldn't do that for Jalen Waddell in year one, right? We're going to see if he could do it for Jalen Waddell in year two, and we're going to see if he can do it for Tyree Kill, right? No more excuses for Tua either. But I do think we've seen Jared Goff put up good statistical years. We've seen him put up good years with Brandon Cooks and, and Cooper Cup. And I think right now, in terms of what Jared Goff can do, Jamison Williams could play a very similar role to what Brandon Cooks did in Los Angeles. And I also think they're going to find ways to get him the football, just like look at the amount of targets that Miami pilfered Jalen Waddle with last year. I think that might be how Jalen uh, Jamison Williams is used early in his career as they eventually, I think, down the line, find a replacement for Jared Goff maybe as soon as next year. But I, but I do think he's going to be a guy that on that turf, when they're playing at home in the Dome, you're going to see explosive plays for Jamison Williams. And I really like what they're building there with him, with TJ Hawkinson, DeAndre Swift out of the backfield, and then how good last year we saw Amon Ross St. Brown. They're putting together a really nice group of offensive pass catchers there that complement each other well, right? Amon Ross St. Brown, really good in the slot, good precise route runner. TJ Hawkinson, one of the more complete tight ends in the NFL. DeAndre Swift one of the best pass catching running backs in the league right up there after the top guys. And now you bring in Jamison Williams, the guy who can win vertically down the field and put that stress on defenses. I kind of really like what they're doing there. I think the lions are on the verge of turning this around and then they're going to have to kind of put that they're building everything else up and then they're going to try to drop the quarterback in there. So it's going to be really interesting to kind of see how quickly does he miss the first four weeks of the season for six how quickly does he hit the ground running? But I think the ceiling on Jamison Williams is as high as any of the other wide receivers in this class, which kind of goes, I don't think there was a ton of separation between these guys. And that's something that I think made it a little bit tricky at the top of this draft there. One last one last yeah. point I want to make about Jamison Williams. We saw how fast the times were at the combine this year. I mean, just blazing times. I would not have been surprised if Jamison Williams, if he were healthy, he would have ran a 4-2. Jamison Williams would have ran a 4-2 at the combine had he been healthy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, John, let me let me shoot it over to you. If, if you have any thoughts on Jamison Williams, feel free to share. If not, keep this going with your pick here at 1.06. Long term, I love Jamison Williams. And I do think that Goff is competent enough to get him the football. I think the narrative around Goff is a little unfair. I do think he's a, you know, he's an average NFL quarterback. He did get to the Super Bowl. I mean, you think about where the Rams were before they drafted Goff. They ended up in a Super Bowl. Granted, they lost to Belichick, but that's a pretty impressive, you know, I'm sorry. It's hard to get to a Super Bowl. It's not an easy thing. So I think he's better than people give him credit for. And I do like Williams in the long run. So I have a hard decision here. And when I have a hard decision, I'm going to stay with my board. And I'm going with Kenneth Walker landing in Seattle. I know there's a challenge with the depth chart right now. Where is Rashad Penny? I don't know if Chris Carson's going to be back. It doesn't look good. I think the odds are against him coming back. We've never seen Rashad Penny play a full season in the NFL. He was terrific down the stretch last year. No denying that. But I also don't believe they exercised his option, correct? 
I think this is his last year. So Seattle looks like they might be ready to move on from him. I love Kenneth Walker coming out. I think he's an adequate pass catcher. The, the, the few catches that I found on film, he's not Najee Harris. He's not Saquon Barkley in the passing game. But he's good enough. I mean, he's at least Jonathan Taylor. And what did Jonathan Taylor probably have like 32 or 33 catches last year? Something like that. So as long as Kenneth Walker is adequate in the screen game and in the flat, I'm fine with that. I understand he's not going to have – I don't think he's ever going to have 60 receptions. That's I don't see that in his outcome. But if you're going to give me 220 touches, I'll take that any day from a running back. And Seattle's a nice spot. Eventually they're going to move on from Pete Carroll. I, I'll take the chance here with Walker. I like him a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing with Kenneth Walker, I think that's fascinating is, listen, we know what Seattle wants to do. And they, okay. they drafted two offensive linemen. They're rebuilding the offensive line. You can make some questions that they built two guys who are better pass protectors than run blockers, which is a little bit interesting compared, you know, considering what they want to do there in terms of pounding the rock. But the injury to Chris Carson sounds like he might not play football again. Yeah. So that's one deterrent that might be added away in terms of Kent Walker getting there. It's unfortunate for Chris Carson, but it sounds like the injury could be serious enough that he won't be able to play this year. And then they re-sign Rashad Penny on a one-year deal. And I think they look at Kenneth Walker as the long-term piece there. Yeah, do I think Rashad Penny is going to get some work this year? For sure. And then the thing about Kenneth Walker, and you kind of said it, let's not be so fast to say he can't be a functional pass catcher just because Michigan State didn't ask him to do that, right? We've seen enough instances, right? Once upon a time, Leonard Fournette was in Jacksonville and before that at LSU, and he couldn't catch passes. And then he goes to Tampa Bay and he can catch 70 a year. And even at times, they don't ask him to do it much. But Nick Chubb has shown the ability to be a functional catcher. They haven't had to use him too much because they have Kareem Hunt. But he's he can be it if they need it to be, right? No. Is, is Ken Walker going to be running wheel routes and lining up in the slot ever? No. But could he catch screen passes? Can he, can he catch a curl? Can he uh, dump off in the flat? For sure. So I think he I think he can be just fine there in terms of being a functional pass catcher at the next level. We know they're going to pound the rock. They're eventually going to have to fix the quarterback situation. We get that. But Ken Walker is in this mix, right? I think top six, top seven, top eight. Some people have even seen him pick him at, at number two, right? And that goes to the settings of your league and what the roster construction is, right? If you're loaded at running at wide receiver and you need a running back, I'm okay with Kent Walker going to in this draft. Yeah, maybe he doesn't have the longevity of a Drake London or Garrett Wilson or those guys, but he could easily be a running, a high running back two or low running back one for a stretch in Seattle that could be very meaningful in terms of your fantasy team. So I I, I get the, the Kent Walker. I think he's a lock top six, top seven type pick in any rookie draft, regardless of settings in terms of this year. Matt, let me bring it over to you at 1.07. If you had any thoughts on Kent Walker, feel free to share. Uh, if not, keep this going with the next pick because I think we're starting maybe one more kind of chalk pick, and then I think it kind of opens up for a little bit of uncertainty after that. Well, I think historically, since I've ever started doing this, I think those of you that have been doing this with me now for a while, I historically always have a really random pick in the first round. I took Kyler Murray one year at number five overall. I took, man, I forget who other, but I had some really weird ones. I'm going to keep the trend going. I'm not going chalk. I'm going off the reservation, but not too far. Because if you remember him at his peak, he was a phenomenal talent. One that we were all clamoring to get a piece of. I'm going at George Pickens. I'm going to take George Pickens here. And George Pickens here for me is one that I, I really can't stress enough. He wasn't good at Georgia. He was dominant when he was healthy. And yes, he, he had a really rough go of it. He tore his ACL in his right knee. It's a horrendous injury. One riddled with so many layers of skill that need to be redeveloped, recalibrated, reattuned or resensitized to the field of play. And all the whispers so far out of OTAs has been nothing but gold gold about Pickens and what he's doing so far. And I'm going to tell you the the depth chart isn't favorable right now, but 
again, he's another player where if I think he returns back to full health, he could be a guy that is transcendent of QB talent. Another guy who could put it all together and potentially be that player that is going to be the guy we go back and look back and be, oh my God, the Steelers just keep doing it again. First Deontay Johnson. Now they take George Pickens. Like, then they took Chase Claypool. I mean, do they ever stop making decent picks at the wide receiver position? The answer is no, they really don't. And some organizations have really good scouts in those areas. You got to respect the scouts in this. I mean, we all love analysis. I give props, major props to those Pittsburgh scouts because they know what wide receivers they can develop and they know how they can develop them. That is a major organizational win. So you know what? I'm going to go with the player that may not win it for me this year, but he could be the guy that you're all coming to me with first and second round pick offerings next year, saying I'll give you a first round pick this year and I'll throw in a player. What Do you want, you want to go for it? And I don't think I'm going to do it. I think he's the guy that I'm going to go with now and take a little bit of risk here at number seven for the certainty of other play areas and other landing spots of several other guys that I really like. But I'm going to go with the the guy who made me swoon when he was a freshman. So I'm going with George Pickens here. Well, listen, once a year, Matt, you you shock usually during the rookie mock drafts. And when you brought up the Kyler Murray thing, that was in a non-super flex league. So that was what made it stunning that year when we did it. This year we are doing super flex. And you've had other ones. But here's the thing about the George Pickens pick. I love the player. And if we are watching the trend that is going on in the NFL right now, Smart organizations are showing a unwillingness to pay major bucks for their, some of their wide big name wide receivers. I'm not sure the Pittsburgh Steelers are going to be in the business of giving Deontay Johnson 20 to $25 million next year if that is what he wants in free agency. And Chase Claypool kind of hit the ground with an explosion that rookie year and made some big plays. And then he kind of came back to the pack last year a little bit. So let's not act like Pittsburgh's depth chart is just unfathomably challenging for Pickens to make a role early. And if not a big role this year, I think a year from now, he can very much have an opportunity to really seize control of a big portion of that. His upside is tantalizing. I thought he was the best true X wide receiver in this draft class. It's just true X. And, you know, Matt, one of the guys that we talk about in terms of loving his process, Greg Cosell, anyone who's listened to Greg Cosell leading up to the the draft that passed, George Pickens was his number one wide receiver. He went on every show and said he liked them more than Drake London. He had questions about Drake London. George Pickens was his guy. And Greg Cosell watches more film than anybody probably is ever going to watch in in their lives. But it shows you that there's other people that see this with George Pickens. And I think we all, anybody in the Devitt community knows how talented this kid is. And it could be another guy that they find in Pittsburgh as a, as a guy that dramatically play outperforms expectations. I, I think if there were no, there were some off the field concerns, but I think the injury is what really made him fall. If that injury doesn't there, I think he's probably in the mix right there in the middle teens with with all these other star wide receivers that went there on night one of the draft. So I'm really excited to kind of see Pickens and where it plays out. This is early for sure in terms of you look at ADP, if you just look at rookie mock drafts that are out there. But I, I like you having a conviction in a player like that because I don't think it would be so far fetched. In a year from now, if we kind of talked, did this again, and we're like, oh, remember when Matt picked George Pickens last year? Maybe it wasn't such a bad pick. I, I, I could totally see that being where this goes a year out from now. Uh, let me make the pick real quick at 1.08, and then I'll, I'll bounce it to Felix and John, and here takes on, if you want to add anything on George Pickens or my pick at eight. But I mentioned before that there was one more chalk pick. So I'll, I'll go ahead and, and finish the chalk picks of the early portion of, of you know, the, the round one. And that's Chris Olave, who went to New Orleans. I've been saying for the longest time, he's part Terry McLaurin. He's part Will Fuller, very smooth route runner. Not a guy who's going to do a lot after the catch, but 
He can win at all three levels of the field. He can get vertical. He's a, he can get in and out of his breaks good. I I look at a guy like Chris Olave, and I think he's the perfect complement to Michael Thomas. And Michael Thomas has not been an elite player for a long time now. Who knows if we'll ever see that again. So I think Chris Olave is going to get an opportunity. I know they just brought Jarvis Landry in there also. I know some people were down on – saying, oh, that hurts Olave a little bit. No, to me, it hurts Michael Thomas. And to me, it might be questions about whether Michael Thomas is fully ready to go from his injury. I think there's big plans for Chris Olave. We'll see if they let Jameis Winston cut it loose this year. That might be the thing that holds back the entire pass catchers in terms of putting up good statistical production from a, from a weekly perspective. But, but the player, Chris Olave, huge fan of, so, John, let me bring it to you, and then Felix, I'll bring it to you, and then you'll keep it going with pick 1.09. John, any thoughts on Matt taking George Pickens or what you see in terms of long range for, for Pickens or any thoughts on, on on me selecting Olave, kind of finishing the chalk guys? I really like what Matt said about the scouts in Pittsburgh, but I want to add to that. I think Pittsburgh has a locker room culture from the coaching staff, and it starts with Mike Tomlin. Not only do they identify the receivers with the skills that they're looking for, but when they bring them in, they coach them up. They just do an outstanding job of creating a winning culture at the wide receiver position. Because if you just identify talent and you don't coach it or nurture it or just allow it to flourish, it's not going to reach its apex. But the Steelers have been so good over a decade of being able to do this all the way. Oh, who was a speedster from Mississippi that they got? Went to the Dolphins. What was like 10 years ago? Mike Wallace. Remember even Mike Wallace? I mean, they just had so much success. It's it's an entire organization does it. And I think it starts with Mike Tomlin. And whoever his receivers coach is, and I should know that, but I don't. But it starts at the top with him. Yeah, absolutely. And Pittsburgh, every year, they seem... Listen, think about what has happened to Antonio Brown since he <laughs> left Pittsburgh. They kept... Either either they did the most amazing job ever keeping him in line, or it just kind of went off the rails later in his career. We'll never truly know the answer to that, right? But every year they get the most out of that, right? You brought up Mike Wallace, right? They found Antonio Brown and Deontay yeah. Johnson, who Matt and I loved. And we were like, wow, they picked him in the third round. That was even earlier than we thought. And then they went on air and maybe they were lying. Maybe they weren't. They said they had him as their number one wide receiver. Maybe they were lying, but maybe they weren't because look how good Deontay Johnson has been. <laughs> so, so, good. so, you know, so they know what they're doing there with the wide receivers. You know, Ben was basically unable to do anything and I'm not the huge I'm not the biggest picket guy but anything that he brings to the table this year is going to be an upgrade on what we saw at the back end of Roethlisberger's career uh there in Pittsburgh so he's got all the pieces and you know Pickens adds another dynamic there and like I said who knows about Deontay Johnson and Claypool for the long haul we're not sure they're going to be there so Felix let me bring it over to you any thoughts on Pickens Olave and if not, then we could transition right into your pick at 1.09. No, I mean, I think you guys hit the nail on the head as far as the track record with uh, Pittsburgh. Mike Wallace, Emmanuel Sanders, Antonio Brown. Go back further than that, and you've got Heinz Ward and Antoine Randall. So they have a long track record of, de of developing guys taken after um, the first round. This is hard uh, because, you know, this is – this is a super flex league. There are some wide receivers that I like, but we're at pick what? Pick nine now. And the only quarterback taken in the first round to those pick Pittsburgh Steelers has not been selected yet. And, you know, think what you want about Kenny Pickett. He is going to start at some point uh, this season. That, that quarterback depth chart, there's no one to be uh, uh, scared of there in Pittsburgh. He should start at some point. So I'm going to take Kenny Pickett here. I mean, we just mentioned all the weapons there, Deontay Johnson, and George Pickens, Chase Claypool, and they got Najee Harris out of the backfield. I 
Kenny Pickett in de- the Debbie community is a Johnny come lately. I mean, didn't break out until his, his fifth year, an older prospect. And a lot of people think that that success is attri- attributable to Jordan Addison. I'm one of them, but still at pick nine in a super flex league. And how wrong have we been on quarterback evaluations in the past? Uh, Josh Allen, we let him in some super flex leagues fall out of the first round in dynasty rookie draft. So I'm not going to make that mistake here. I don't feel great about it. I don't feel great about it, but it is a super flex league. And so I'm going to take Kenny Pickett here. Yeah. And, and Fizz, we just talked about it, right? He's got the weapons. And again, oh, yeah. I'm not a huge Kenny Pickett fan, but when I look at Kenny Pickett, do I think he can be somewhere on the spectrum from good Andy Dalton to Jimmy Garoppolo to Kirk cousins to what we started to Mac Jones last year? Yeah. And some people think he could be Derek Carr. And to be honest with you, if he could be Derek Carr, that's viable in fantasy, especially in super flex leagues. And he has the pieces there and he has the guys to be a functional player. We'll see how much they let him rip it. But I, I do think now that we got through those chalk guys and then the surprise pick of George Pickens, I think it does start to get to the area where you would see some people be willing to pull the trigger on Kenny Pickett. Like I said, I I'd, I'd be a little bit more reserved to do it, but I think that's more of just my not loving him as a player compared to the fantasy aspect of it. I think fantasy wise, I could see and understand in a, in a two quarterback or super flex league making that move, especially if you need a quarterback and quarterbacks are always constantly uh, in high demand. John, let me bring it over to you. Any any thoughts on Felix taking Kenny Pickett? I know we were talking Pittsburgh a lot, so maybe can of keep that going. And if not, then kind of take us right into your next pick. Kenny Pickett, I had two players I was eyeballing on my list, and Kenny Pickett was obviously one of them. I agree, we've been wrong a ton, but he does end up in a good organization, and he's the only quarterback with first-round draft capital. So there's obviously value there. And talk up, we're, we haven't even talked about Pat Fryermuth and Najee Harris. I mean, he does have players around him. Now, I'd like to see that offensive line a little better, but that's a different that's a different question for another day. So I agree with that. But since Felix took him there, and I would have taken him if, if Felix passed, I'm going to go with my highest receiver. And I, I'm mad at myself. I didn't talk a lot about him last summer, but maybe it was because he wasn't on the radar. I wasn't impressed when I was studying Dwayne Estridge. Sky Moore did not jump off. But by about late October, and you start looking at some of the numbers, and then he just kept hitting every benchmark. I love the game tape and the film, the production at the end of the year. You know, for for a group of five, he declares early. Then you see him at the combine, and you're like, wow, he's so much more athletic. Because that's, to me, that's always the final stage in the group of five. How athletic are they? They look athletic, but they're playing against cornerbacks who might not play in the NFL, right? So that's the challenge. But, man, I had him so highly rated, and he ended up with Patrick Mahomes on a depth chart that at wide receiver is pretty depleted. They lost Sammy Watkins, Byron Pringle, right? And so I'm just looking at he might have 80 to 90 targets, and he's with Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes. So I'm going to take Sky Moore here, bank on the quarterback and the coach, and I do love him as a prospect. Yeah, I mean, listen, Sky Moore is a guy that I think we were all surprised that he was the 13th wide receiver taken, right? I yeah. I was a little bit more reserved than some people. I couldn't get him over guys like George Pickens and over some other guys who I just – thought they showed their ability at a bigger program against better defenders. But there were a lot of people who, Dane Brugler, who we love here on Saturday, Sunday, and so many other people, you know, Todd McShay and others who had like uh, Sky Moore is like the seventh or eighth wide receiver in this draft class and thought he was going to be a potential late first round pick to the Kansas City Chiefs or if not an early second round pick. And then we kind of hit the second round and a lot of guys kind of came off the board and, you know, we were surprised. Sky Moore kept falling. Sky Moore kept falling. And Tyreek Thor- uh, uh, Tyquan Thornton went ahead of him. And Wendell Robinson went ahead of him, who I don't think it's a reach, but you know most people did. And Alec Pierce and others went ahead of him. And then he ends up with, after the Chiefs trade back, they still can get Sky Moore. 
And now he steps into an offense where, let's be honest, we know Travis Kelsey is going to get his. Juju Smith-Schuster hasn't been the same player for a couple years now. Like the, He doesn't look like the guy that, that once upon a time went into the offseason as like the number one asset at wide receiver in dynasty football, right? Because he was so young. And he looks more of just like a big slot guy, and that's just going to be his role, possession guy. Mikol Harmon is now the time he's going to break out after Tyreek Hill leaves. That's probably not going to happen. Maybe they have plans for him. They brought in Valdez Scantling. He's more of a vertical, stretch the field type guy. So there's this wide open depth chart there for tons of targets that Sky Moore is going to get an opportunity early to kind of – carve out a niche and then just keep growing and building upon that. So it's going to be really interesting to kind of see how quickly he, he builds a rapport with Patrick Mahomes and how quickly the stats start producing, right? Cause the stats are going to be there, but is it just going to be spread out early on that maybe we don't see any wide receiver truly produce for fantasy like we want. And it's mostly just Kelsey. And then, you know, one week it's this guy and another week it's this guy. And, and we don't have that other consistent guy that, we're plugging in as a wide receiver four or a flex or a wide receiver three. I think that's going to be to be determined, but for dynasty, I mean, we fast forward a year. Who's to say sky Moore can't be to Kansas city. What the Johnson turned in for Pittsburgh, right? That wouldn't be, that wouldn't be added a realm of possibility, especially when you're attached to Andy Reid's offense, you're attached to Patrick Mahomes. There's a lot of things there that are positive. Matt, let me bring you in. Any thoughts on where John went with Sky Moore, or if we go back one, uh, Felix going, uh, Kenny Pickett, or if not, uh, maybe uh, go to your next pick then at 1.11. Yeah, I mean, I guess this is the opportunity for me to, to mention somebody that we won't mention tonight because as soon as we mentioned Sky Moore, I typed in all caps Justin Ross because he's a player that, to your point, um, we talked about George Pickens, another player that, again, I think fell off the radar due to injury, but again, was in the conversation for being arguably the top wide receiver in the country. And I know people will say, well, that's not true. Just rewind the clock two years ago. And all of us were clamoring to get him on our team. We were comparing him to everything. So I think Sky Moore is a beautiful pick because not only did Kansas City go and get him, but he fits a need within their system that's defined. He's got a role. He has no other competition there. I think I would take shots not only on Sky Moore, but also Justin Ross as a late-round flyer. I wouldn't let anybody else take him. I would have him on my team, even if he just sits there for half a season until they see what they have in the players around them. The Kansas City offense will fly. It just depends on who they're going to fly with and how they're going to get there. Kelsey can do a lot but it's not going to be all Kelsey. Will it be Clyde edwards Alaire finally reaching the ceiling of where he could be? I don't know. It's going to end up being a discussion that we're all going to have to wait and see. But the, but there's one thing for certain. The ball's going to be in the air. Somebody's catching it, and they're scoring, and they're scoring touchdowns. So, Sky Moore, let's go get him. And I'm going to go right now, and there's two players that are in my mind, and to kind of feed off of my Justin Ross love, uh, I, I, I man, I, I don't I don't want to do chalk. I just don't want to do chalk. I want to keep shaking the cage. I want to keep shaking the cage, and it's probably not a smart move because of the longevity of the position is never certain. But I'm going to tell you, the particular way that this player plays the position could be a transcendent type of quality that will allow him the shelf life that other players at his position don't typically see. And I'm talking about James Cook. And I'm thinking about going running back here. The reason being is we all need running backs and we're always looking for them. And I think James Cook has a terribly crazy depth chart. And I, and I understand everybody talking about single Terry and what's he going to be and what are we going to do? I really fundamentally believe that when you look at James Cook as a receiving back and a back between the tackles, do you, he was phenomenal this year. He was good in every facet of the game. He's a great receiver. He can run routes. He's a guy that I could see Buffalo saying, we're going we're gonna to use him in tandem with Singletary maybe once in a while, and we're going to maybe stretch, put him on the field, maybe, maybe kind of like what Jacksonville was claiming they were going to do with Travis Etienne before the injury, make him kind of that quasi-slot receiving back type player. I could see them doing that because they kind of already did that and Josh Allen typically loved that type of player. 
right? And we're talking about, obviously, we're talking about the Cole Beasley's of the world, McKinsey's of the world, those players that garner targets because of their ability to handle the short area, make people miss, get those short yard catches and turn them into big gains. Josh Allen needs that because he is a big quarterback and he can run and he is excellent and skillful in the open field and he's got a howitzer of an arm. But let's not mistake what he can do with what he can't do if there's not adequate threats on the field to create the space that he needs to do those things. James Cook gives you that. He's a little bit of everything. He's not one-dimensional. He's multi-dimensional. And he's not the safest pick here. But he is a pick that could easily find his way into the hearts of coaches where he'll never not have a job. And that could be very interesting on a number of levels. I mean, Austin Eckler. Austin Eckler came out of nowhere. Wasn't Austin Eckler just supposed to be a receiving back? And then all of a sudden, Austin Eckler's Austin Eckler. I mean. Could James Cook become that guy? I don't see a reason why it couldn't happen. He's a phenomenal back. And I think he really took a step forward this year after finally getting everything together. So I'm going to shake the cage one more time and go James Cook. Well, Matt, I don't I don't think this is necessarily shaking the cage. I, I'm I'm in two drafts that are going on right now. James Cook is went five and eight in my two drafts, right? There one of them, the one who went five is a little bit more skewed running backs and wide receivers. But I think people, I think people have finally converted over to what we've been saying at Saturday to Sunday for years that James Cook is a, is a special player, and it took going to Buffalo and it took going in the second round to kind of I think sway the tide over to what we've been saying here at Saturday to Sunday that this guy's skill set is very reminiscent of Alvin Kamara coming out of Tennessee. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to sit here and say he's going to become a top three overall r- running back in fantasy football. Nobody thought Alvin Kamara was going to be that. We at, at Saturday Sunday who loved him didn't think we, he was going to have the NFL career that he did. But what we did see and what we did say and what we did see in vision was a guy that was going to be a versatile offensive weapon that has even had his running ability uh, – increased in terms of his skill at the NFL level. And I think that's why Matt and I have been so excited about James Cook. I think there's more to his running game than we've seen because they just didn't need to use it. I know he's 190 pounds. He's not going to be a guy who's going to carry a heavy workload or anything like that. But I think he could be a guy that could be a 14 touch type guy. And you give him, you give him five or six catches, you give him seven or eight touch runs, and I think he could be a really high-level impact. I think he could arguably be the missing piece in that Buffalo offense that helps them get over the hump and get to the Super Bowl this year because he's unlike any of their other running backs. And I think once he starts becoming a big factor, I think they're going to find it hard to take him off the field. So I think – and then if you're playing PPR leagues, I think he's going to be a guy that – Sooner rather than Match later, up. he's gonna be he's gonna be producing RB two type numbers, and it's gonna be those very safe RB two numbers where you feel comfortable every week, eleven points, twelve points, and then he finds the end zone with a spiked week, and now you get a twenty spot. And I think I, if you didn't take him, I, he would have been my pick here, at, you know, because I didn't want him to get out of round one, just because we've been big fans here, and I think we're at the point where this is where he should be coming off the board. Uh, so I, I think you're right on there, and. Let me finish it out, and then, John and Felix, I'll bring you in as well to kind of get your takes on James Cook. At the last pick in round one at 1.12, one more wide receiver was taken in round one. I think people are sleeping on him. I keep seeing him fall in, in, in rookie drafts. I think Jahan Dotson, I don't know if it's the commanders. I don't know if it's pre-draft takes, but Jahan Dotson went 16th overall in the NFL draft. The commanders moved back. I think with eyeing him, they wanted him. That tells me they didn't have much separation between him, Jamison Williams, and Chris Olave. Who knows, right? We've seen major wide receivers be on the move. Who's to say Terry McLaurin is not the next one, right? Who's to say that uh, he's not a guy that they don't want to invest $25 million in or, or whatever that. We just don't know that anymore, right? It's a different world now. Guys that we would be like, oh, they're going to be there for second contracts guaranteed. It's just a little bit different right now. We're not sure that, that that's going to be the case. Uh, but even if he is, I, I look at Jahan Dotson, and I know we've brought him up a couple times tonight, Deontay Johnson. I kept saying, to me, Dotson is a better version of Deontay Johnson 
except he's more athletic, he's faster, and he's got better hands. So does that mean he's going to be put up the stats? No, it doesn't mean that, but he's coming in with every characteristic. And this is a guy who plays bigger than his measurements. He goes up and wins it. He's got good ball skills. He's got good body control. I like Jahan Dotson. You had the draft capital at 16. Personally, I would have taken him over a couple of other guys that were already taken so far. Uh, George Pickens, Sky Moore, even though those guys – in terms of the landing spots, I, I like a little bit better. Uh, but I think the draft capital and the skill that Dotson has, I'm really intrigued by him. And I think he's going a little bit down, uh, a little bit later than maybe he should be. Uh, so I'll gladly scoop him up here at the 1.12. So there's round one, guys. Real quick recap. Uh, Brees Hall got started at 1.1. Drake London at 1.02. Garrett Wilson at 1.03. Traylon Burks at 1.04, Jamison Williams at 1.05, Kent Walker at 1.06, George Pickens at 1.07, Chris Olave at 1.08, and then rounding out round one was Kenny Pickett, Sky Moore, James Cook, and Jahan Dotson. John, let me bring it over to you. Any thoughts on Matt selecting James Cook uh, and then me rounding out round one with Dotson? Well, I like James Cook a ton. I have him at number 11, so he actually came off exactly where I have him ranked in my Superflex rankings, so I like him a ton there. And I'll tell you this, Matt, Paul, I like Jahan Dotson too. If he falls to me at the top of the second round in any dynasty, I'm snapping him up. I will consider him late in the first round, but I've seen him fall into the second round. I'm a very big Jahan Dotson guy. I think it is the landing spot. Pre-draft. I had him above Sky Moore and George Pickens. But Washington, you just I just don't feel overall comfortable in the in the commander's organization right now as I do in the other organizations. Yeah, and that makes sense. I mean, think about what we would have thought if he went to Green Bay, right? Like who, oh, who knows what, who knows where he would have been right now? Would would if he'd been going right there with Jamison Williams ahead of the, like he he would have been probably in the mix there. Felix, let me bring it over to you. Any thoughts on James Cook, Dotson? Uh, if you had a thought on the Sky Moore pick and what Matt brought in Justin Ross, any anything there that we haven't been, had a chance to bring you in on on, on these last couple of picks? Yeah, uh, Dot or excuse me, Cook is a player that I would have been trying to trade up for. If you look at the Buffalo Bills history, I mean, this is a team that you can tell very clearly has a plan. When they brought in Stephon Diggs before that, they were trying to trade for Antonio Brown. I would argue that Antonio Brown and and Diggs exist on the same spectrum. They're separators, very easy for quarterbacks to throw to when we were trying to improve Josh Allen's uh, completion percentage. James Cook is a very good player, but he was unfairly compared to his brother because his last name is Cook. But he's he's his own player. He is a utility weapon. You can use him in a number of situations. I think that the Buffalo Bills, like that you mentioned uh, Cole Beasley. Again, another player that we're trying to uh, improve Josh Allen's completion percentage. I think that that's what, what um, James Cook is going to be for Josh Allen, another way to in increase his completion percentage. I really have, have to believe that. I mean, I mean, I think back, back to my Detroit Lions when they had um, uh, Theo Riddick out of the backfield and he could do a number of things in the two-minute drill. Well, James Cook is a much better interior runner than Theo Riddick uh, ever was. So um, in the Buffalo Bills, uh, seventh in the league in, in passing last year. James Cook is going to be on the field a lot. And if I had 2022 assets, I would be trying to, at the end of that first round, I'm like, all right, I need to trade up here to get James Cook because he would have been my pick if he had fallen to me. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes people hear a GM or a coach or somebody say something and they hold on to it, right? So right after he was drafted, they said that, you know, we wanted J.D. McKissick. Obviously, it didn't work out in free agency. And then, you know, we see James Cook being able to do a lot of what J.D. McKissick was going to do when we were trying to bring him here. That doesn't mean he's that's all he's going to do. And I think sometimes people hear one thing, and I'm going to bring up something very similar to this later. Trust me, I will come back to this with a different player when we talk later. But I think sometimes people hear something and they just kind of hold that, right? I guarantee you they did not draft James Cook where they did to just make him J.D. McKissick. 
They got bigger plans. They've taken guys in the third round two consecutive years. They didn't even let it get to the third round. They saw him. They knew the Giants were very interested. He might have been the Giants pick early in the third round, to be honest with you. Maybe not after the one the Robinson pick. But I, I think those two organizations, obviously, there's a lot of links between them. I think they thought the Giants were going to be targeting him in, with their early third round pick. And the Bills weren't risking losing out on him because I think they did really think that James Cook maybe could be the missing piece to that offense and, and add something that. Uh, they're lacking there. So I'm really excited for James Cook. I think he's going to be an explosive player. I think people, again, worry too much about bell cows. Those are gone. They are so few and far between the bell cows that I think we can't overreact to guys who are just going to have a role, whether that's 12 touches, 14 touches, 15 touches, the days of the 20 to 25 touches, they're probably very, very much in the minority. We're not going to see too much of that anymore. That doesn't mean they can't be high impactful fantasy assets, even if they're touching the ball 12 to 15 times a game. So Felix, why don't we kick this off round two guys? We're going to go a little bit more rapid fire. I'd like to go through all of round two and then also around the horn of best available remaining then that would make up, you know, pretty much our round three. So more just to pick here. Uh, if you have one quick comment, please share it. And then I'll transition right over to the person uh, who is on deck. So Felix, you kick us going here with the 2.01 pick. Yeah. Another running back with a complete uh, skill set, being able to catch the ball. He's got adequate size. And that's Rashad White. Uh, he took the road less traveled tra transferring from Juco uh, to Arizona state uh, eventually taking over for a very highly touted prospect in his own right and in Diamante Tranium. So um, I, I like Rashad White. I like his landing spot. I like that offense. And I like uh, the fact that, you know, after Leonard Fournette, I don't know that you're necessarily scared of Giovanni Bernard or Keyshawn Vaughn or any of those assets. And third round is relatively high draft capital for the running back position. Yeah. I don't know how many years more Tom Brady's going to play one or two. We'll see. But it's not inconceivable that if he was to play two years, let's say Rashad White gets a little bit of time under his belt, Rashad White could be a 70-catch player in the NFL. I truly believe that that's the kind of skill set he has where he can catch 70 passes. And I think he's got some untapped rushing ability as well. He reminded me a little bit of Antonio Gibson, a little taller, a little bit of an upright running style, but that versatility – we haven't really seen Antonio Gibson be used as a versatile guy. They kind of turned him into an inside between the tackles runner, which has been a little bit questionable. But I really like Rashad White there. I think Leonard Fournette is more of a product of Tom Brady. And I think White could be a guy that could have a little bit more lasting value there, uh, even after, obviously, Brady uh, calls it quits and, and finds his way into the Fox studios there uh, for that monster contract he signed. John, let me take it over to you at 2.02. I was hoping Rashad White would be there, so uh, I got sniped. But I'm going to go with Christian Watson. And I know there's some questions. I love the landing spot. The depth chart is not very right now. It looks like Alan Lazard is the number one target in Green Bay. I think there will be opportunity there. I'm not sure if he's going to get between 60 or up to 90 targets. I think he's going to be an efficiency receiver. You know, maybe he gets 60 or targets, but he averages like 18 yards of reception. So you're hoping for efficiency out of Watson, but you still have Aaron Rodgers there. So I'll take Watson. Yeah, I mean, I think Watson – Reminds me a lot. See, I don't think he's a Devontae Adams replacement. I think he's a Valdez Scantling with more upside type replacement. Think Martavius Bryant. Uh, to me, the question to Mark about that was how quickly is Aaron Rodgers going to build a rapport with a guy who come from a small school, right? Like Aaron Rodgers goes to the guys he trusts. They made that bold move up. I went on air right after, you know, round after round one ended and then after night two ended of the NFL draft. And I just kept saying, I wish they would have been more aggressive in round one not round two, to go get Aaron Rodgers. They are a win-now team. They needed a more of a win-now wide receiver. I would have even been more happy if they went and got George Pickens, who at least had played in the SEC, had played against big-time competition, uh, more against better defenses where maybe if Rodgers did gain his trust to say, here's a jump ball, go get it. I think Pickens is a little bit better at doing that against the level of opponents but christian watson's upside is very tantalizing as well matt let me bring it over to you at 2.03 you're on mute yeah i'm going to be honest with you i'm struggling a little bit with this one 
because now we get into the area where it's like, you know, wh- where are you going to go and what are you going to do? So I'm going to just kind of live, live where my heart leads me. And that's kind of where I've been doing it this whole time. And I'm going to, I'm going to kind of stick with my guys a little bit here. And it came down to three players for me. And I think, I think when push comes to shove, I'm going to have to say that the New York football giants select Wandale Robinson here at the pick, because again, I think what I love about it is it's the new regimes wide receiver pick. It's not the wide receiver pick that they inherited. This was a guy that they chose. And for that reason, I'm going with the, the longevity of that saying these guys, like we said, you know, they're all looking at the same napkin drawings that they make of plays them in Buffalo. So I would assume that Wandale Robinson is going to fit just like Felix. So kind of eloquently talked about with James Cook and Cole Beasley. I think we're going to live in that world with Wandale Robinson as well. I could see him playing a very similar role as what James Cook would going to play for Buffalo. So that might've been the compensatory pick they were looking for was like, wow, we didn't get James Cook, but we got kind of a player who could do what he could do as a receiver and he's pretty tough. He could he could probably run jet sweeps and do a little bit of everything for us. So yeah, let's go ahead and take Wandale. I'm gonna go with that pick right here. New York Football Giants. Well, Wandale Robinson. That's my yeah. Pick. Listen, anybody who's been following me on Twitter, anybody who's been following me pre-draft, when the Robinson was in my was my seventh rated wide receiver pre-draft, I absolutely loved them. Uh, I didn't think the NFL reciprocated that love. And then we were proving that they really did like him a lot. And there's been a lot of rumbling since the draft that the Chiefs were maybe going to pick him and they liked him more than Sky Moore, that that, that the Bills were eyeing him at the end of the second round, and, and maybe they were the ones that pivoted to James Cook, and, and they were looking to – and they did draft Khalil Shakir later on, which you could say could do some similar things to Wendell Robinson as well. Uh, my take on Wendell Robinson is I think he's an extreme value. Listen, I understand he's an outlier. I understand he comes into the league with a 0% – length in terms of his arm length and he's got to be an outlier but i also do understand that this is a guy who immediately in nebraska played a integral role as a hybrid running back wide receiver more running back than even wide receiver he transfers to kentucky a mediocre team in the sec if we're being if we're being generous and immediately dominates over a hundred catches in the best conference in America against the best opponents and the clear focal point of that offense. So I don't think when, when the word gadget is used with Wendell Robinson, I think they are looking at the measurements and they are using the word gadget incorrectly. The NFL is a space game. Now it is about stressing defenses. It is about using that space and, and, and creating problems for the defense and, and getting your playmakers in space. And the Giants now have a coach who is going to do that. And Mike Kafka came from Kansas City, who knows how to utilize motion and all different things. You're going to see him run jet sweeps, the push passes, the, the quick screens. But this is also a guy who I think they envision, and Felix brought it up before, making life easier for Josh Allen was Cole Beasley. I think they look at a guy like Wendell Robinson, and they think he could be Cole Beasley plus out of the slot, and then they also think that he can win vertically and be a vertical slot player. And you could also do the, that other stuff, the, the gadget stuff. But people are kind of just associating Isaiah McKenzie to Wendell Robinson. That is such a disservice, such a disservice to Wendell Robinson. Isaiah McKenzie caught like 40 passes his entire collegiate career. Wendell Robinson caught 105 last year at Kentucky versus the best defenses in the country. And yeah, are they going to use him in gadget ways? Yeah, the 49ers use Debo Samuel as a gadget player. No one. What, so, what does that even mean, though, Paul? What is <laughs> gadget? I mean, I'm sorry. Like, I got to just like gadget. To your point earlier, it's a space game, right? It's called get the ball from one end of the field to the other. It doesn't matter what position it is. And I agree with you, Wandale Robinson can do that. Yeah, and I, I just think people are so rigid in, in what their measurements are, right? Elijah Moore was beloved last year. He's five foot nine, the same exact weight. Five foot nine, one more inch. And Rondell Moore has been was a Debbie darling for years, even though he never produced after his first year in college. And I like Rondell, but people loved him because of that first year in college. He was drafted as a second round pick in the NFL draft last year because of that first year in college. And I get it and it warranted it, but he was five foot eight also. I know he had more mass to his body. I get that. But I feel like these rigid measurements, people people are so rigid with it. And I think they're downplaying the draft capital 
and the team. He's their wide receiver, right? They hand chose him because, and they traded down twice because I think they wanted him all along. He was the guy they said, we're not getting that around two without taking Wendell Robinson. They wanted him for the offense. They're kind of building there. I'm excited for him. If you didn't pick him, I was going to take him with this pick. 2.04. I'll keep this going. Alec Pierce, wide receiver who was drafted by the Colts, obviously comes out of Cincinnati. We know what the Colts like. It wouldn't have been my pick. I would have went Sky Moore. I would have went George Pickens. But we know what the Colts like, right? They like the big, physical, athletic wide receivers. Pierce has a great athletic profile. Lewis Riddick, who I appreciate and and really respect Lewis Riddick. Lewis Riddick thinks Alec Pierce is going to be a flat-out superstar. He thinks in three years he has the capability to be the best wide receiver in this class and and, and a flat-out stud. I'm not sure he ever reaches that level, but I do think he can push to be a long-term starter there and be just as good as Michael Pittman. I don't think this is a clear Michael Pittman's going to be the one forever. Alec Pierce is number two. I think Alec Pierce's skill set is right on par with what Michael Pittman's was coming out of college, and I think they could form a really nice duo there. I think they're probably still one wide receiver short, maybe a more a, a more shiftier, smaller type guy, and and they can find them, you know, down the line. But but that would be where I would go here with 2.04. I would take Alec Pierce. Felix, let me bring this over to you for 2.05. Yeah, I mean, you talked about uh, uh, Rondale Moore and ha- having that excellent freshman season. Well, his two subsequent seasons when he was not on the field because he was injured, it was David Bell that was producing. David Bell drafted in the third round by the, the Cleveland Browns. That's a a team that just added Deshaun Watson. They don't have Jarvis Landry anymore. They don't have Odell Beckham Jr. I look at that depth chart. Who's going to be starting at wide receiver? It's going to be Amari Cooper. And then after that, I mean, are we talking about Donovan Peoples-Jones? No, I think it's going to be David Bell. I think there is a non-zero chance that David Bell is is, um, the league leader as far as rookie receptions this year. So, I mean, it's a it's a really easy pick. I think David Bell is a value. I know he didn't have the athletic testing that everyone wanted to have, but here at 205, a player, a rookie who's a wide receiver is going to start with Deshaun Watson. I'll take that all day. Yeah. And listen, I think I know they don't have similar body types, but I think David Bell could easily move right in and be for Cleveland what Jarvis Landry was. I think he's going to be a possession guy, might play big slot. You know, especially if Diamond Peoples Jones shows more growth and development, and he's that guy that they want to use on the outside in three wide receiver sets. Who's that? Who's going to push to the slot? It's not Amari Cooper. It's not. It's it's probably not going to be Donovan Peoples Jones. That's not where he lives. Cooper could probably go in and do a little bit. So when they go three wide, it's going to be David Bell as that big slot type guy, that good possession guy. The biggest questions about David Bell in terms of NFL transition is: Does he have the separation ability and the athleticism? But if you put him inside in the slot, I think you mitigate some of those concerns and he could be a really impactful possession, big slot wide receiver. I think he could survive on the outside as a possession Z, all that. He's not going to be a guy who wins down the field vertically, but we've seen, you know, I don't know why this name just popped in my head. Think about Stevie Johnson way back in Buffalo, right? The couple monster years he had. Like a guy like even a guy like Stevie Johnson, and he didn't even have the college pedigree of a David Bell. It, that's just one guy that was a bigger guy that that moved into the slot because I didn't want to go to the typical Marquise Colston, right? Because I think I think David Bell's a, a more athletic guy and can play more on the outside than what we saw Colston, who I think came into the league as like a tight end and then switched to wide receiver, but. David Bell is a guy who great collegiate production. We knew the athletic testing was going to hurt him a little bit, but the fact that he found his way to draft day uh, round three, day two draft capital was huge for him, especially in the landing spot that he went with a wide open depth chart. They need a third guy. They need someone. People Jones is going to be the vertical guy. Cooper could do a little bit of everything. He fits the perfect role of what they need there. I really like the fit for David Bell there. I like the pick here at 2.05 for you. John, let me bring it over to you, 2.06. Matt had mentioned taking his guys. And I'm looking at my charts right now, my rankings. And I have one guy I definitely like pre-draft more than most. And I still like him here. I'm going John Mechie. He landed in Houston. It's not a great spot, but it's an interesting spot. Davis Mills, were we all wrong? Can he be a pro quarterback? We're going to find out. Texans could be vying for a top two pick next year. But you have an older Brandon Cooks. And then you got Nico Collins, who I liked last year, but he didn't really show us too much. 
So there could be opportunity here. And I really think Mechie, the injury, let's, you know, he might be a pup guy similar to Jamison Williams. But I think in 2023, John Mechie could be a starter in Houston. Yeah, John, I love the pick there for Mechie. I think he, there's nothing about his game that's super sexy, but he does everything, yeah, all the little things good. right, right? He's a good route runner. He's got good hands. He's got good ball skills. He's got good body control. And the name that I've thrown out there a lot is, to me, there's a lot of similarities to when Robert Woods came into the league, not the elite year that he's had with the Rams, but when he was drafted by the Bills, when he first left the Bills and went to the Rams and started to become the much better player, I think John Mechie can – be that kind of player for Houston. And listen, they I don't think the landing spot is as bad as it is, right? I think the Texans are starting to turn the page. We'll see if Davis Mills can be that surprise round three quarterback that turns into a franchise guy. I think that's to be determined. But they got Brandon Cooks. I'm not a big Nico Collins guy. So I even, even if I was a Nico Collins guy, I do think they fit well with the three guys they have there. But I think Mechie could quickly become the number two type guy there in that offense after Brandon Cooks once he once he's deemed healthy and ready to go. Matt, let me take it over to you for 2.07. Yeah, so, I mean, I think I'm going to continue to just shake the cages and go crazy. And to be honest with you, I want every listener to know out there that this year in our Dynasty Football League, Paul, I'm officially calling a protest because you situated me just ahead of you. I actually sit one spot ahead of you. I noticed this. You're drafting behind me in that league. And now I'm ahead of you in this league. I think you're taking notes, and I just want you to know this is not <laughs> very nice because I think I think we're gonna. You know what I'm. You know what I'm gonna do now. But I know you won't follow me on this pick, so I'm gonna make this pick right here. And this pick is gonna be somebody that is totally off the reservation. But I think if he could emerge, I was wrong with Jared Stidham. It didn't work out. I missed out on getting Patrick Mahomes. I didn't get him early enough in every one of my leagues. But I'm not going to miss on Matt Corral if he hits. I'm going to go and take Matt Corral because I think there's every indication that he's going to have an opportunity to succeed. I know that's the anti-Malik Willis moment, and people are wondering, how could you do that? Listen, Malik Willis is the safe pick. He is the safe pick. And you're going to have to wait a year probably. Maybe a little bit more, but I mean, you got to wait a little bit. But I think Matt Corral is going to get a very soon-to-be opportunity. And unfortunately... Um, at the expense of Sam Darnold, who we could say, you know, a lot of terrible things have kind of befallen him in his career. But I think Matt Corral could be a guy that he just takes it and he runs with it. And if he could run with it, there's plenty of weapons there in Carolina to actually choose one. Could he unlock Terrence Marshall Jr.? Can he use Christian McCaffrey for a full season? Will he be healthy? And will he give him what he needs in order to be successful? I mean, it's not a team devout of talent. So Matt Corral is a guy that he got better every year. He overcame adversity at Ole Miss to be a better player when he came in as when he left. I'm going to take that and I'm going to ride with Matt Rule and say, Matt Rule knows he's on the hot seat here. It's going to be Matt Corral's show at some point this year, I guarantee you, if things with Sam Darnold aren't going. So I'm going to say, let's see how that goes. I'm not going to miss out on a guy that I think has the potential to be a good quarterback in this league. Yeah, listen, I mean, we're, we're talking super flex here, so I think this is the right time now to start taking a shot on some of these quarterbacks that remain. Listen, I, I don't think Sam Darnold is the answer. I think Matt Corral has a real chance by week eight, by week six, to maybe be thrown into the mix there to kind of turn the season around, maybe try to save Matt Rule's job. Uh, and let's be honest, you know, John brought it up before, like with Atlanta, I think he was talking about like next year, Bryce Young, CJ Shroud. Not everybody can get them, right? There's a lot of teams that we keep talking about, like, oh, wait till next year, wait till next year. And I know when I came on, Felix, with you and the other day, right, we were talking about some of the other guys, right? Maybe Anthony Richardson becomes a big-time thing and there's a third quarterback or a couple other guys develop, right? You know, maybe there's somebody comes out of nowhere and is a Joe Burrow type or Kenny Pickett type, but maybe not, right? And, like, yeah, we all think C.J. Stroud and Bryce Young are going to be the guys next year, but we also thought – Sam Howell and Spencer Rattler were going to be the guys this year, right? Things change from one year to the next. So not everyone's going to get the top quarterbacks in next year's draft. 
So there is a possibility that if Matt Corral plays well, he could seize the moment, seize the opportunity, right? No one thought Davis Mills was going to be the starter again this year in Houston, and he seized the moment, seized the opportunity, and Matt Corral has more skilled players around him in Carolina than Davis Mills sure did with Houston. So there's an opportunity there. I like Matt Corral's playmaking ability. He was my number two quarterback in the draft after Malik Willis, so Matt knows my feelings on him. All the listeners know that I was a fan of him. I see some part Tony Romo to his game. Uh, obviously not at the level of Tony Romo, but in terms of his movability, playing off structure, uh, you know, incorporating his athleticism a little bit, there are things about Corral's game that I was a fan of. If we keep this going at 2.08, I'm going to go back to the running back well here, and I am going to take uh, Damian Pierce, who was drafted out of Florida to the Houston Texans, talking about a depth chart that is there for the taking. Damian Pierce was a guy that for whatever reason – Coaching malpractice that Florida didn't use him more. This is a guy who has a three down skill set. He's not going to be this great receiver, but he's a functional receiver. He's a good pass protector. He can run inside. He's got good footwork. He's got, he's got play strength, you know, the ability to absorb contact, deliver punishment. I think he's going to quickly have a chance there to, to lead that backfield in touches and I think now's a, a good place in a rookie draft to make an investment in a guy like Damian Pierce and see if he could become that guy that becomes their lead guy there and and could produce maybe RB t- low RB2, you know, or high RB3 value. I don't think he's ever going to be like a, a dominant fantasy running back. But I think this year there's not a lot. It's not a deep draft in rookie drafts. So I think now a guy like Damian Pierce with the early day pre draft capital in round four. You add in the wide open depth chart. Um, and you also think about where Nick Casero came from in New England. They're probably not going to invest a lot of high end resources at the running back position. We see what New England does, right? Ramondre Stevenson, Damian Harris. Like you could kind of envisioning them looking at a guy like Damian Pierce and, and envisioning the same role as what New England did for some of their bigger, more physical backs. So he'd be the pick there. Felix, let me jump this right over to you. One pick each left for us. Who do you got as your last pick of the night here at 2.09? Paul, you said it earlier that, uh, you know, what is a bell cow now? You know, people, the running backs aren't getting 20 touches plus touches a game. Uh, I'm going to go um, to someone who could carry if, if needed to, uh, Isaiah Spiller. Excellent freshman season. You, you know, a player that I think we expected a little bit more from. Before this season started, I did a video breakdown with my friends Jared Wackerly and Nick Whalen and sounded the alarm a little bit on Isaiah Spiller saying, like, this guy does not necessarily run as physically as a 220-pound back should. However, I do like his vision and his patience, his ability to set up blocking. He's in the off- in that uh, in that Chargers offense with Austin Eckler in front of him. I think that he is going to be – the the uh, uh, have a role this year and be maybe used at the goal line and um, uh, so I like the landing spot I like the potential opportunity and despite not having the athleticism that I might want from that position he does possess some traits that compensate for the lack of athleticism patience vision so uh, and he's an adequate pass catcher out of the backfield so I'm going to go with Isaiah Spiller here at the 209 and if you had asked a year ago I mean Isaiah Spiller would have been considered the number one or number two back in this class right along with Brees Hall yeah absolutely and every year the Chargers invest in a pick in day three we kind of get excited right Larry Roundtree the list goes on it's every year every year because they uh, they they do understand that if they want to maximize Austin Eckler's career, they have to be smarter with his touches and smarter with his workload. And every year they try to reduce his workload, and then they're unable to because the running back they draft doesn't really materialize. Isaiah Spiller comes into this situation more talented than those guys I talked about, the Larry Roundtrees of the world. I'm drawing a blank on some of the other ones. The kid from uh, Northwestern, Justin Jackson, was in the mix there, and there was another one also uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah, Josh, yes, uh, Joshua Kelly. So uh, they always have somebody there, right? And and then it just hasn't materialized. But Isaiah Spiller comes in with more talent than those guys. And I think they, as Austin Eckler is a little bit older now, they really got to try to commit to saying, okay, we can't just force feed him into the line of scrimmage. We can't just pound him inside. We could let Isaiah Spiller do that. So I, I like the fit there with Isaiah Spiller. 
stopping the run is not going to be a defense's primary goal when you're facing the Chargers with Justin Herbert and those weapons they have. So I think Isaiah Spiller's got a real opportunity there. Yeah, we would have liked to see day two draft capital, but running backs, not a lot of running backs get day two draft capital. It's just the nature of the beast anymore. You know, we just don't see that too much anymore. John, let me bring it over to you. 2.10, last pick of the night for you. I, I will wait on the quarterback still. I'm not comfortable grabbing one here. And I don't like any of the tight ends. Trey McBride, who knows when he'll get on the field. So I'm going to go with a player who's actually risen in the last couple of weeks. And it's really because of news coming out of Dallas. I'm very worried about Michael Gallup. I don't know how bad this injury is. Don't know when he's going to get on the field. And they got rid of Amari Cooper. They traded him. So what does that tell me? I think Jalen Tolbert might be playing a lot faster than I even thought three weeks ago. Loved him coming out of South Alabama. Highly productive. You know, dominated the Sun Belt. He got nice draft capital for a G5 wide receiver. I mean, the NFL is impressed with him. And if Gallup doesn't play the first six to ten games, I think Jalen Dolbert's going to be on the field for a lot of snaps. And playing with Dak Prescott in that offense with C.D. Lamb, I'll take Tolbert here. Yeah, I really like the pick there. Tolbert was a guy that I would have been eyeing here with my last pick coming up. Uh, I think he was the one guy that, that kind of stood out to me from the wide receiver position that definitely should have went in this round. So I'm, I'm glad you made the pick there. Matt, let me bring it over to you for 2.11, last pick of the night. Well, uh, I got to tell you, uh, John made my pick really easy because Jalen Tolbert was a player that I was looking at as well. So I'm going to take a running back that I really like here in Brian Robinson. I like Brian Robinson a lot because I think you talk about a player who could emerge as one of the best backs in this particular class. I wouldn't be shocked if Brian Robinson is the guy we're talking about as the guy who emerged as a potential three down back of the future for a particular team and for that team in Washington. Maybe they don't end up loving Antonio Gibson, or maybe they see a timeshare being something that they're going to live with. But Brian Robinson, since his time in Alabama, is a player that has always had the capabilities of being good between the tackles, very solid in the passing game, was able to catch passes and also find space in, in tight spaces as well. So he was a player that, from the longest time, it's not his fault, he was behind freaks like Derrick Henry and Najee Harris and <laughs> – Guys, like I mean, was, these guys are all perennial like running backs, freaks, right? But Brian Robinson is a freak of nature in his own right because of the consistency that I think he can give you on the ground. And he's a good player, a good, solid football player. I'll take him for the length of the career. I think he could be a very solid player whose best years are still ahead of him. Yeah, I listen, I think well, for whatever reason, Antonio Gibson hasn't been utilized the way that I think most people thought he should have been when he was drafted out of Memphis. And it's clear he's had some ball security issues and they don't seem to want to use him as a receiver much. And they brought back JD McKissick and now they invested in Brian Robinson in, in on day two draft capital, I think to add to that mix there. So who's to say he doesn't get an opportunity down the line. I'm not sure Antonio Gibson get, gets a second contract once his rookie deal is up there uh, with the commanders. And I will close this out torn between two players here, but I think I'll swing for the upside here. It is super flex. Uh, we've only had one quarterback. Uh, we had one quarterback in round one and Kenny Pickett, and then Matt took Matt Corral at 2.07. I'm going to go one more quarterback here, and I'm going to go who what was my QB one uh, in this draft class, and that was Malik Willis. I think there was a little bit too of an overcorrection uh, in terms of letting some of these quarterbacks fall in terms of their skill sets. And Malik Willis is a guy that we saw Jalen Hurts as a round two guy get an opportunity and the impact he's had on fantasy. And let's be honest and call it what it is. Jalen Hurts has not been a very good thrower of the football at the NFL. If you really study Jalen Hurts, we'll see if that changes this year with the addition of A.J. Brown and Devonta Smith in year two. But right now, Jalen Hurts has not been a great thrower of the football, but that does not mean he's not been a really good fantasy quarterback Malik Willis would be something similar, even if he gets thrown into the mix. I don't think it's a little bit more of a long-term play. I think Tannehill's locked in for this year, maybe two years. But, uh, but 
we'll see. If Tennessee has a bad year this year, they might just pull the plug on Tannehill ne- next offseason and say, okay, let's take a shot here with Tanny, uh, with Willis. Let's give him a year and then see if we have to go in the quarterback market the year after. His rushing upside, his his natural arm talent, if he can put it all together, he's got the upside to be a top 10 fantasy quarterback because of the dual threat capabilities. Um, so I'm going to make him there. There was one other guy I was talking about. I'm sure we'll talk about him uh, when we go rapid fire around the horn here in terms of best couple uh, available players. Uh, so round two, real quick, 2.01 was Rashad White. 2.02 was Christian Watson. 2.03 was Wendell Robinson. 2.04 was Alec Pierce. 2.05 was David Bell. 2.06 was John Mechie. 2.07 was Matt Corral. Uh, 2.08 was Damian Pierce. 2.09, Isaiah Spiller. 2.10, Jalen Tobert. And then rounding it out, Matt took Brian Robinson at 2.11. And at 2.12, I took the upside of Malik Willis. Felix, let me come over to you first. One, two, three names off the top of your head. Who would be some of the next guys that you would be targeting if we were keeping this going into round two? three let's give the listeners uh a couple more names that almost would make up round three sam howe is one i think that he could potentially compete for the starting job there um after uh carson what's once self-destructs zamira white trey mcbride i think that those are the uh some of the names that i would be considering right about now yeah and zamira white for for people who are wondering who i was torn between between malik willis it was zamira white because i do think the writing is on the wall this is josh jacobs's last year Zamir White was my number uh, six running back pre-draft. I like his game. I think he could easily be the lead of a committee next year with the Raiders. They'd bring somebody in to be more of that satellite player. But I could see a scenario where Zamir White plays their Damian Harris or Ramondre Stevenson role with the Raiders, with Josh McDaniels now there. So I, I think he's a sneaky guy who's going a little bit further you know, then he's fallen behind Brian Robinson, Damian Pierce, Isaiah Spiller. And I think he's kind of right there in the mix. I like the Howell uh, and Trey McBride. John, let me bring it over to you. You got two or three names that you would say would be next on the list that aren't the guys that Felix said. Yeah, I have three guys who I have in my top 36 that I, I would be targeting. Keontae Ingram landing in Arizona. Love him. Underrated pass catcher. Kyle Phillips. The kid from UCLA at the Tennessee Titans. I don't think anyone's talking about him. I think he's a very sneaky slot receiver with some quickness. And then Greg Dulcich of the Broncos. I'm hearing really good thing out of the Denver camp. Very interesting athlete. He can attack the field deep down the scene. Those are the three I'd be targeting who are a little later, but I have them in the top 36 of my super flex rankings. Yeah, I think Dulcich is a guy. Listen, the only reason he's even sliding as far as he is is because of the love of Albert Okawebenam, and understandably so. But Dulcich is a guy that I think the draft capital, the pass catching ability, he's a guy that is of high intrigue in round three. And I love that you brought up two guys who probably are going more round four. I haven't really checked rookie draft ADPs, but my guess is Keontae Ingram and Kyle Phillips going a little bit later. But I think Keontae Ingram only – Listen, I know they just signed Darrell Williams, but it's James Conner, and then it's wide open there. So Keontae Ingram was a guy that I was a big fan of too. Uh, so I like that. And then Kyle Phillips could be, you know, I know it's it's taboo to say it because, you know, the, the slot type player and the size, but he, would anybody be that surprised if he's Hunter Renfro in a couple of years from no, Tennessee? Like in terms of what he, how he played at college, how he wins, really good route runner. I could totally see him being that kind of player for the Titans as we've seen Hunter Renfro develop. And Hunter Renfro fell to day three, Kyle Phillips day three. A lot of similarities there as well. Matt, you got a couple names that were maybe next up on your list? No, I think we had a lot of the guys from round three already mentioned. So I'm going to go into the UDFAs and free agents and guys that are really deep dive type players. So I'm going to go – with another New York football giant. And I'm going to tell you to really kind of keep an eye on and see what Daniel Bellinger is going to be doing at tight end. It might be very interesting to see what they do because Ingram's gone. It's wide open. There's no, you know, there's no pass catcher there. He was a very versatile athlete in college. I I would say, keep your eyes on him. And I'm going to pound the table again for Justin Ross as a guy that, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. And if he continues to blow up at OTAs, and he continues to provide a target and a kind of uh, package in terms of skill and ability that affords, you know, really Patrick Mahomes some options he never has had, to be honest with you, if he could put it all together. 
I think you could see that being a great player to kind of land in and, and go ahead and go get. So I would put those guys as two deep sleepers. You guys already mentioned Keontae Ingram. And I guess the last guy that I would kind of throw out there just to, to mention it one last time is I, I would still take a take a look at Tyquan Thornton and see what they do with him in New England. You know, there were some people that were interested in him. Obviously, New England's track record with wide receivers is speculative, to say the least. Um, but, but, but if you invest in a player, I want to believe that you have some thought or role as to what's going on. And, and let's see if they actually can put it together and keep that, you know, your eyes on those guys. So those would be the three players that I think are going to be really fourth round guys later, UDFA guys that I think are worth keeping on your radar. Yeah, I like the Taekwon Thornton. I think he'd probably end up going in round three. Bellinger's a sneaky under the radar. Might take him some time to to develop, but I, I think they're envisioning a Dawson Knox type scenario there. And then some other guys that we didn't talk about that I think will make up a lot of round three, especially in the super flex. We didn't talk about Desmond Ritter. He might have a real chance to seize control of the quarterback room there in Atlanta, either during this year or get a chance next year if they don't get one of those top quarterbacks. Uh, at the running back position, probably somewhere in round three or round four. I know people are questioning and they, they thought it was a reach, but Ty Davis Price was a, was a running back who was drafted in the third round by a team that no matter who they put out there produces results, unless your name's Trey Sermon. So Ty Davis Price, if he gets an opportunity there in San Francisco, might be able to deliver. Tyler Algier is a guy who's been going, he's been going ahead of some of the guys that we drafted in round two in my leagues because people are looking at the wide open depth chart there. Uh, Algier could have an opportunity as soon as this year. A little bit further down, Hassan Haskins and Pierre Strong are two other running backs getting drafted in, in most leagues. Uh, at the wide receiver position, we hit on a lot of guys. We didn't talk about Danny Gray. A real opportunity in San Francisco to be their third wide receiver this year, and we'll see kind of what happens down the line with Debo Samuel. To me, he's got a very uh, Darnell Mooney-like skill set. Romeo Dobbs. I would not be surprised if Romeo Dobbs has a better fantasy season in year one than Christian Watson. I think he's more pro ready. I could see Aaron Rodgers really liking Romeo Dobbs' game. So he's an interesting guy. And then Khalil Shakir, does he step right in and, and become like that slot guy on the inside there uh, with Gabriel Davis and Stefan Diggs on the outside? So Shakir's interesting. I know everyone mocked it. I know he's 25 years old, but Valus Jones, it was a third round pick. He's going to probably be force fed an opportunity there. So he should be on people's radars. Calvin Austin. I know he's not a guy for now in Pittsburgh, but we already talked about that earlier in the show that there could be open opportunity down the line and a tight end. We talked about Mc, uh, McBride, Greg Dulcich, got Jelani Woods, Jeremy Ruckert, more of a stash. And then keep an eye on Chig Aconquo, Tennessee. I think they have a lot of role. Uh, they have a role for him to maybe be their future Delaney Walker. Uh, type player there so I think he could be an interesting name so there it is guys a lot of guys are going to make up round three round four let's go around the the horn one last time any final parting shots uh please let the audience know where they can find you anything you're working on you want to share uh and thank you guys so much for being on we'll go in the order that we did the draft so Felix take it away Again, gentlemen, thank you for having me on. You can find me on Twitter at Sharp Review. I'm at camp. All of my content is at campusdecanton.com. Uh, you can check out the Campus to Canton YouTube page and the podcast feed. I host a, uh, a podcast every Wednesday called The Debbie Debate, and that is where you can find me. John, thank you so much for being here. Any final parting shots? Uh, parting shots, let the audience know where they can find you as well. Yeah, congratulations, gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be on your 500th show. Um, you can find me on Twitter at GridironSkull91. I couldn't afford the A and the R when I signed up, so it's GridironSkull91. And right now it's college fantasy football season. I transitioned to, from the draft to college fantasy football, and I will be at the FF Expo in Canton, Ohio. You can meet me. We're having a live college fantasy football draft on Saturday, um, August 13th at 10, 10 a.m. It'll be broadcast live. You're more than welcome to join us, talk to us, have lunch with us after. Love to meet everyone there. But now it's college fantasy football season. Awesome. Make sure you're checking out John's work. Make sure you're following him. Make sure you're following Felix uh, and checking out all the great content that they are producing and following them on Twitter. Matt, let me bring it over to you. Final parting shots here as we round out episode 500. 
I don't know what to say, man. I, I'm going to say the same thing I started with. It's just it's just surreal. And to be able to spend it with friends and to be able to sit here tonight with gentlemen like yourselves, like John and Felix, you guys have been a part of this journey in so many ways. And it's really been a pleasure. And to those people that were watching tonight, thank you so much for all the little like the all the little sentiments along the way. Congratulations and all those things come across our screen. It just it just it just feels great to be a part of this. And and Paul, I think copying me and staying behind me in the draft tonight <laughs> was really speculative. I still want to put my official word out there and just say, you know, this is this is this is Bush League. Um, so on that note, uh, yeah, I'll be looking this summer to start getting back into the groove, looking at the 2023 freshman class, taking a deeper dive into who they are, what they're bringing back to it. Uh, I know, Paul, we've talked a lot about broadening the, the, the grip and the reach of Saturday to Sunday in terms of experimenting with the YouTube channel, what it could be more of. So be on the lookout for things like that during the summer as we get into the 2023 class in terms of the Devi component of it, as well as obviously looking at the prospects as we put together the notebooks for next year. So Paul, a lot of work ahead of us, but man, I, I'm, I'm ready to go. Yeah, absolutely. And, and guys, just a, a couple more thank yous here to round out episode 500. First off, if it wasn't for our sound and tech engineer, David Nakano, none of this would happen. I know Matt and I have said repeatedly that we don't have the time, the energy, or the patience to, after recording, wanted to, to do the tech work that involves getting these shows out. So a huge congrats and thank you to David Nakano, who ha kept, keeps everything going behind the scenes here for us to do what we do at Saturday to Sunday. Uh, I know Jeff Abercrombie, who has been my co-host for a big chunk of this year uh, with, with Matt, uh, you know, being unable to be around, wanted to join us. He's actually international on a family vacation right now in Ireland. We were supposed to record this last week, but, you know, we had some COVID issues running through uh, Saturday to Sunday that we had to postpone it. Uh, big shout out to Jeff and all that he has brought to the table here at Saturday to Sunday. Uh, we look forward to doing so much more uh, with Jeff. Uh, in the upcoming years. And then some thanks from people who helped us in the past get started. I mentioned before when this started, it was me, Matt Caraccio and, and Nick Whalen. And, and then Nick went on to do other uh, different things and other people uh, stepped up when Nick uh, stepped away. And, and that was uh, Bill Ladin, uh, uh, Doug Green, Brandon Jones. Uh, uh, Matt, help me out. Who am I forgetting? Who helped out a lot in the beginning? Uh, I, Eric, I, yeah, Eric Coleman, EC. Uh, yeah, so. so EC, so EC, Doug Green, Bill Ladin, Brandon Jones, you know, they, they helped out so much as, as regular contributors early on in Saturday to Sunday, uh, you know, after me, you and Nick got this started and, and our thanks goes out to all the people that have been regular contributors, have been regular guests every single year. I know I mentioned that John's been a regular. Uh, the support from him has been tremendous from so many other people in the industry and community. I know Matt Walton and Sigmund Bloom are two guys that we have leaned on a lot over the years and, and very grateful for how much they've helped us in terms of where we got gotten. But there's so many other people in the industry and the community uh, that we'd be here for another hour if I started running through every name uh, in terms of people that has helped us get here to 500. So on behalf of all, Thank you to everybody. Thank you for our listeners. Uh, we love that what we do here and we look forward, hopefully, like I said earlier at the top of the show, another 500 plus more of these. So on behalf of Matt, on behalf of Felix and John and our sound and tech engineer, David Nakano, thank you for joining us for this special episode 500. And we look forward next time taking you from Saturday to Sunday. <laughs>